Oh, seriously? Hey you guys, welcome to another video with me, 6 Plus Stevo. This one's going to be something a little different. Um, and most probably my longest video to date. Um, I don't really know if it's going to be successful, if it's going to be an interest to anyone, but it's something I wanted to do. Um, I've prepared myself by getting a few cigarettes rolled because I think I might be rambling on for some time. Um, I haven't really scripted anything out or whatever. I'm just going to sort of start at the beginning and go from there. But this, this video is um, essentially my personal history through Games Workshop um, and all its games and ranges, etc. And my experience with it um, and what it means to me, really. Um, so yeah, where shall we start? Um, let's start at the beginning. So I am a young lad in primary school. Uh, I'm into the things that most young lads are into. Um, I was huge on dinosaurs, um, watching He-Man, Thundercats. Uh, this is the 1980s, by the way. Um, yeah, He-Man, Thundercats. Um, I was into anything like aliens, robots, monsters, fascinated with monsters. Used to love um, watching the old Harryhausen films and uh, the old Godzilla movies and things like that. Um, yeah, loved all that kind of stuff. And the reason that's important, I think, because um, a lot of these influences and things, I think, uh, helped shape my um, imagination and... Uh, into the sort of fantastical and stuff and uh, paved the way for uh, what I was about to discover. But one thing in particular that really got my imagination going, and I think it's probably the same for a lot of people out there, was um, the Lord of the Rings, um, The Hobbit from J.R. Tolkien. Um, and the reason I was discovered that so early on was because I was blessed um, to have a really good teacher Back in primary school, um, this would have been about 90, 91. Um, and she read to the class um, The Hobbit um, over the series of a few weeks. And because uh, she was a huge fan of it and she wanted to share it with the class and sort of teach us all about it. Um, and not only did she read us the book, which I just was fascinated by I, I've never heard anything like it before um, it was totally different to anything else we'd ever been read it, it to me it was incredible um, and not only did she read it to us but uh, we made a whole project of it over the sort of few weeks afterwards we were drawing pictures we were drawing maps and she built in elements from Tolkien's work into our usual studies so like when we were working on geography and stuff we were doing maps of middle earth and things so yeah um huge credit to her um i think when you get a good teacher like that um that really sort of inspires you and sh teaches you something that gets you passionate about something you remember that teacher for life and i still remember her to this day and uh yeah she's got a lot to answer for actually um but yeah so with all these, you know, fantastical things and these books and cartoons and toys and everything, um, it paved the way for a game that I discovered at a friend's house. Um, and that game was Hero Quest. Excuse me, one moment. Hero Quest. Um, I was blown away by it. Um, I think it was a family friend. Um, so we used to, um, as a family, we would sometimes go over um, with my dad. Um, we'd go over to friends of his and we'd sometimes play board games, things like Monopoly, Cluedo, etc. You know, the two families would sit around and play games and stuff. And they were great fun, a game of life, things like that. Um, one evening, they pulled out Hero Quest. Um, and I, I was blown away. 
absolutely blown away. Here was, um, in my mind, the the Hobbit in game form. You know, we were exploring dungeons and caves. Um, I would always play as the dwarf every time. Always play as the dwarf. Um, but this game was incredible um, to me. Um, not only was it a, you know, a fun game to play and we'd you know sit around the table having a good time as a family or whatever, but this was... Uh, your imagination just went crazy. You weren't using little tokens and stuff. These were little miniatures, little monsters. You had skeletons, you had goblins, you had orcs. You had freedom to go wherever you want. You make choices. You weren't just rolling a dicing on squares. And this was a whole new way of playing games to me. And uh, I was just completely enamoured with it. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the picture showing on screen at the moment, you'll see. Um, I'm sure some of you watching this will remember the game fondly. And I think for a lot of people, this is their first experience of a Games Workshop product. Because this was um, this was really mainstream, and although Games Workshop, you know, is probably more popular now than it's ever been, and making a lot more money now than it's ever been in its history, um, it just seems to be going from strength to strength lately. But back in this time, I think this was when um, Games Workshop products were about as mainstream as you could get, because these games they weren't just found in Games Workshop stores. Um, this was you could go into your local. Uh, Woolworths or your, um, there's one blast from the past there for you, um, or any sort of uh, toy store selling board games and things, and there was Hero Quest on the shelf, so it was mass market, it was advertised on the telly, for God's sake, I mean, when would you see that these days? Um, and check out the advert for Hero Quest actually, because it's, it's quite funny, you can see it on YouTube, um, I might put a link in the description actually, um, it's quite cool and quite nostalgic. But yeah, Hero Quest was uh, incredible and loved that. And uh, ended up, I never actually owned Hero Quest myself, always wanted it. Um, I had friends um, that had the game and uh, would regularly play games around the friends' houses and things and was just fascinated by it and was always asking my dad, you know, please get me Hero Quest for my birthday or Christmas, etc. Um, But I did receive a game for Christmas, um, a boxed game, um, and I thought very excitedly, this is Hero Quest. He's got me Hero Quest, and I opened it up, and uh, it wasn't Hero Quest. It was something even better. It was an another game. Um, from Games Workshop called Space Crusade. Now, um, again, this was, uh, oh man, fucking hell, Space Crusade, I've got so many good memories from that game. Um, going back a little bit again um, to sort of things that influenced me and um, inspired me, um, around this time, I was a Big movie buff, uh, still am, I always have been, and uh, loved anything sort of sci-fi fantasy and things, you know, Star Wars, um, Conan the Barbarian, all this kind of stuff. Um, but there was one film in particular that was, I just could not stop watching, and I thought it was the greatest movie of all time, um, and that movie was Aliens. Um, I absolutely bloody loved it. It was incredible. There were these um, marines in space going through these corridors, fighting off aliens, xenomorphs, and um, they were just the coolest guys that you've ever seen. Um, the aliens were terrifying. Um, it was action packed. It had everything in it, that movie that you know, sort of an 11, 12 year old boy could love. It was just incredible. Um, and there was this box game in front of me where, in my mind, essentially, it was Aliens, the board game. Um, but it had elements of uh, sort of uh, Hero Quest things. You still had the orcs and things there, um, now called Space Orcs. Um, you had four players, 
three of which would control squads of space marines. You had ultramarines, you had imperial fists, and you had blood angels. And this was my very first taste of the 40k universe. Uh, at the time, still very young, was completely unaware of the Games Workshop. Um... Because these games were made by a company called uh, Milton Bradley, MB Games. Um, so this is why they were so sort of mass market. They kind of licensed the uh, the universe or something from Games Workshop and bought these games out. So, yeah, I was still completely unaware of Games Workshop as a company and the sort of wider range and universe that was out there ready to explore. But this Space Crusade game... Much like Hero Quest, you were exploring um, rooms and corridors, you know. Uh, but rather than seeking sort of treasures and um, glory, you were there completing missions and objectives. You had uh, you had to scan rooms. You could see blips on your radar. You know, you could see where the inspiration from like aliens and things come into it. Um, it it was fascinating to me it was incredible um i later got an expansion for it called uh what is it? i think it was called like dreadnought assault or something um and you got more dreadnoughts in the box um the dreadnought was so cool in there the chaos dreadnought didn't look like dreadnoughts that you see now it reminded me more of uh ed 209 from the robocop movies another one of my favorites and such a cool looking robot um so all these things, again, to a young lad, are just the coolest. And I love this game. Um, and we used to sit and play that as a family. Um, and it was incredible. We used to have friends around and we'd play it. And Yeah, it was an incredible game. So, Space Crusade was done. Loved playing that. And uh, later on, I ended up getting another game. Um, called Battle Masters. And I've got this for Christmas. Now, I can't remember what year this would have been. This would have been sort of... Uh, probably just leaving primary school, just starting high school, maybe, sort of 12, 13, something like that. Um, and Battle Masters is not quite so well known as Hero Quest and Space Crusade, but still made by Milton Bradley. Um, it said it on the box as you can see on the picture, sort of uh, from the makers of Hero Quest. But this was essentially uh, a sort of basic version of Warhammer Fantasy Battles. Again, at this point, I'm still completely unaware of Warhammer. Um, but this was uh, no longer were you exploring uh, you were you know you weren't a lone sort of barbarian or a dwarf or you weren't a a squad of marines you know exploring these sort of tight confines you were now on the open battlefield and you were a commander and you had a huge army um either of imperial um and elf allies or you were the evil side of orcs and goblins and beastmen and chaos and ogres and all that good stuff. Um, and the game came with a huge sort of PVC four foot mat on a sort of hex grid. And it laid that down on the living room floor and all your um, models came on a sort of a big square base with sort of five or six models on each base. So rank and file, but they were just, you know, all stuck on one base together as a, um, a unit. And you would draw cards and move these things across the hex grids and into formations and fight each other and battle each other. And uh, it was it was brilliant. I played that game over and over again. Um, I had a friend that lived next door to me and he always used to come round and play it. And we used to play it just game after game and take over the living room playing this game. And it was, uh, yeah, it was brilliant. And it really was sort of like a... Um, they. A, sort of a, a great getting started set really in a sense um they talk now um games workshop about you know getting new people into the hobby and making it easier for people and they do these sort of snap fit models and easy build and sort of uh, versions of the game to ease people into hobby but these are uh, all three of these games hero quest space crusade battle masters all three of them i think was probably the best ever 
way to get young people into the hobby because the rules were quite easy to grasp and quite easy to learn and they were sort of designed sort of as family games you know the parents to teach the youngsters how to play these games um and uh yeah although they were simple they really let your imagination run riot and uh sort of sowed the seeds for um getting into the plastic crack hobby um yeah, I, all three of these games I've got such fond memories from from my childhood. Um, absolutely loved them. But anyway, um, moving on from that, I'm now in high school and uh, have sort of uh, moved away from those games now. I'm into sort of computer games and things, playing on my Super Nintendo and stuff. And then uh, I'll see a friend in school and he's reading this magazine um and some things in the magazine catch my eye and i'll go over to see what he's reading and uh he's reading a copy of white dwarf and uh i'm looking at it thinking this stuff it all looks familiar i'm seeing all the orcs and goblins and space marines and stuff and i'm thinking this these look very similar and that's when he tells me all about this game called warhammer Forty Thousand. And this other game called Warhammer Fantasy. And other games like Man of War. Um, and uh, Space Marine Epic 40k. And uh, I was blown away by it. Because uh, this just opened a whole new world for me. I was always quite a creative child. I loved drawing, loved uh, writing stories and things like that. And... Uh, yeah, anything that let my imagination run right. And uh, so here was a here was a whole game and a range where I could build things how I wanted. I could paint them how I wanted. I could create my own army. And uh, you weren't restricted by the sort of uh, you know tiles on a board game or uh, what just the contents that was in the box. You could expand it. You could grow it to whatever you wanted. Um, you could have tanks, you could have monsters, you know, you could have anything. And uh, I was just, that was it then. That was it. The, the seeds were fully sown. So I used to get White Dwarf magazine all the time, flip through the pages, read it cover to cover, and just sort of dream of owning the models and the armies in there. But uh, obviously, I'm a young 13 lad in high school getting a bit of pocket money um i was never really able to afford much of the stuff i did used to go to a model shop hmm, and buy some of the cheaper sets i remember probably one of the first models i ever bought would have been uh, an elder jet bike that i think at the time cost around four maybe five pounds and uh it was uh yeah, I built that up, and uh, it had a, it had a, I can't remember what it was. It was like some sort of, it was a jet bike, but it had like the gun on it was metal. The rest of the model was plastic, but the gun was metal, and uh, it would always annoy me because it would always fall over. Um, the metal bit at the front always weighed it down. It would always fall over. <laughs> I don't know why I still remember things like this, but yeah, I just just used to buy just random models that I like the look of and the sort of uh, the smaller cheaper boxes that I could afford but uh, eventually I persuaded my uh, dad to buy me Space Marine um, what it was called at the time I think later on it became called Epic 40k but uh, yeah essentially it was Epic 40k because um, and these were tiny little models um as most of you watching this will be aware of, um, what they call it, 15 mil scale or something. Tiny though, tiny little models, smaller than that actually, I think. Um, and on each little square base, you'd get sort of five troops on each one and you'd get titans and stuff. And this game caught my imagination because I love the idea of just legions and legions, just a huge army. Um, I like the sort of really small scale of it where you can just have thousands of troops and stuff. And you used to go into the model shop then, they used to sell little sets of that, again, for about £5. And you essentially got like a little army in a box, um, with tiny little soldiers and marines and orcs and things. And uh, 
yeah, I've got the game, but um, the game was a little bit more complicated, and I essentially had no one to teach me the rules. Um, I did have another friend at school who had the game, um, but neither of us really read through the rules properly. We just used to sort of play our own sort of version of it. I think we were playing a really sort of crap version of it, but we were having fun, and we were just sort of throwing random models and things against each other that probably shouldn't have even been in the same army but uh yeah it was it was it was fun though um again I'd, I'd, i never really read the rules and things properly i got caught up in the imagination of it all i'd buy a set and just get home frantically build it all um in the ways i thought was cool um it turned out i built most of the stuff completely wrong um I remember getting a box of uh, Epic Eldar and just mixing all the different types of models on bases because I thought they looked cool like that. And it was later on my friend said to me, what, what are you doing? You can't have them like that. You've you've got to have all the same ones on the same base. You've mixed, you know, I don't know, Wraith Lords with Guardians and stuff. You can't do that. You, I, I, was, <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, so I was gutted at that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah... So that was fun anyway, but it didn't last too long, Epic. Um, anyway, um, sort of dabbled around with it. Later on, I ended up getting, um, probably again as a birthday present or something, or me badgering my dad to get it for me, I got um, my first copy of Warhammer 40,000, second edition. Um, this was the edition that came with a big orc army. You get loads of Gretchen. They all looked exactly the same. Um, loads of orcs again all looked exactly the same and you get some space marines in there um, and uh, you even got then you got the uh, a stand in um, orc dreadnought killer can thing but it was a, a cardboard cutout that would sort of stick on a on a base um, I can't imagine they'll ever do anything like that again at least I hope not um, even then I, I kind of knew that was just crap um, but uh, yeah, again, this was a game I was probably too young at the time and I didn't really have someone older or whatever to sort of teach me the rules of it. Um, so although I had the game, I never actually played a game of second edition. I just sort of used to set them up and play with them and, you know, sort of tinker about with them and things. Um, and eventually um, I think I sold that off in a, in a car boot or something. But uh and that was it then. Um, then I sort of, as going into teenage years, um, sort of phased out of the hobby for a bit. Um, it was always there. I was always, I just occasionally buy the White Dwarf magazine, um, read it. Always wanted to get into it. But at the time, you know, you're a teenage lad, you're out with your mates, uh, into computer games and stuff, um, chasing girls, you know, all the teenage stuff. So, um, you kind of, uh, this geeky little hobby that was on the side was sort of, as you came older, it became the sort of the, the uncool thing to do. Um, so it was sort of to the background. It was always there. I always liked it, always wanted to, but just never really had anyone else who showed any interest. Um, any friend I ever mentioned it to was just like, no, nah, I'm not going to play that. That's, you know, geeky or, or, or they just weren't into it. You know, they were into playing football and, you know, less nerdy pursuits. Anyway, later on, we're going forward, jumping forward quite a few years to sort of about 2000, 2001. And uh, third edition is out. And uh, the guy I work with at the time, um, we get talking about the hobby. And uh, he says that he's, you know, got an army and he plays. And he played uh, Corn Berserkers. And uh, yeah. And he said, yeah, I'll teach you how to play the game and everything. So finally, there was my in. There was my in. I had someone who had an army, knew the game, knew about the hobby, was just as nerdy as me and wanted to play. Um, and so now I'm now I'm older, I'm working, um, I'm earning my own wage, and uh, I can finally sort of uh, get into this hobby as I always wanted to. So going to the games workshop, and the army I end up picking is um, Imperial Guard. Um, 
but specifically Kat Katachan Jungle Fighters. Now at the time they had their own codex, so I ended up uh, went in the store. I blew a lot of money. Um, I bought a few boxes of uh, Katachan Jungle Fighters. I remember buying a Sentinel. Um, bought the Imperial Guard Codex and the guy in the Games Workshop. Please. I think they still do to an extent now, um, but back then I was a bit more naive in that. And they were really were, they they pushed the hard sell, you know. Oh, if you need that, then you're going to need this and you're going to need this. And I was just whipped up into the sort of excitement of it all. Um, so I picked up the Imperial Guard code. He said, oh, if you want to do Katachan, you're going to need this. And there was a Katachan Jungle Fighters Codex as well. So I picked that up and a load of paints and everything. I can't remember how much I spent, but it was a lot of money. Come back and start building up these Katachan jungle fighters and things. Um, and uh, have my first sort of little practice game against my mate. And very quickly realised um, that, geez, this army is going to be hard. Because um, I sort of realised how um how many models i was going to need if i wanted to do a catch hand jungle fighters army um and i was new to painting it all and building it all and having not a limitless amount of money it became very daunting and so uh i was sort of put off the idea but around this time a new army was released uh with a codex for the first time and that was the necrons and uh, reading about them in White Dwarf, mm. I just thought they were the coolest thing going. They were um, they came with the little green rods in the guns, um, this kind of Terminator esque undead robot army from the beginning of time. Um, they just looked so cool to me. They looked so different to anything else that was out, and uh, that was it. I was sold because I thought, there you go, this army as well. It's going to be uh, fairly low cost because uh, you're going to have quite a, quite a small sort of elite army and easy to paint. Um, that was the big draw to them as well. And so uh, I gave up on the Catachans and uh, got myself a Necron army and slowly built that up. And that was it. That was my army then. I was Necrons all the way. I had a few games against my mate and his corn berserkers um, and got off to a good start was winning games and uh, painting them up they were looking really good um, and yeah just uh, that was it then that was it third edition was where I really sort of got hooked completely into 40k um, ended up leaving that job and going to another job um, and uh, meeting another guy um, Kev, um, Snake Eyes Kev we called him because he had the uncanny ability of rolling more ones than anyone else I've, I've ever known. If he ever goes to Vegas, he'll be broke <laughs> within a within a day. Um, he'll probably be watching this video and he'll be laughing right now because he'll totally agree with that. Um, probably the most pessimistic gamer I've ever played against as well. Um, he's in his mind he's always going to lose um, he's always going to be rolling ones and essentially he does although he doesn't lose he did, never used to lose all the time he did roll a lot of ones he was famous for that um, but through him um, I met his brother and his cousin as well and so and there was another guy at work um, and uh, so we had a quite a good, sort of built up quite a a big group of us about um five of us would uh, regularly all meet up and play games um and all collected different armies and that and um it was around this time as well that started going to a gaming club near me um in a little uh it was in a little scout hut and uh I remember the first time going there with a mate of mine and we were trying to find this place late in the evening um, out in the countryside uh, where this gaming club was held in a little scout hut and uh, we couldn't find the place for a while. Um, we were sitting in the car park sort of looking around wondering where this place was and then uh, we see a guy walk past long hair and a trench coat carrying like what looked like a briefcase uh, and then another sort of uh, guy 
in a similar attire carrying another briefcase but uh these were obviously uh carry cases and that and with the trench coats and the sort of goth looks and things we thought ah there we go follow those guys they look like our kindred spirits and uh yeah so we found the club and uh that was great um because there was a place where we could go and they had scenery they had tables they had books we could borrow um and uh yeah every week we'd go there and it was just a it was a nice atmosphere to go and chill out have a coffee play against different people different armies see other people's stuff um they set up tournaments and things and it was yeah great fun <sighs> then later on fourth edition comes out and uh fourth edition was that was a cool edition actually this was a cool set as well um the starter set for that came with the tyranids um and this is where i did start doing a tyranid army as well um it was it was a good edition fourth edition actually i enjoyed it it was pretty much as most of the editions since then since third was just a sort of a slight tweaks on third edition um, essentially third edition has been the sort of template up till just recently really with the release of eighth edition um, every edition since has just sort of tweaked it and added to it and enhanced it and changed things but essentially if you could play one you could play the other they're essentially the same game um, fourth edition was good um, and I think it's a lot of a lot of people out there like fourth edition although it did have some funny rules it was the edition that had the unkillable falcon grav tank um god the thing used to drive me mad um literally unkillable um <laughs> this is probably going to be a subject for another video though um but yeah fourth edition came and went and that was great then we had fifth edition um this is a very popular edition of the game and probably up until recently was my favorite edition of the game well one it fixed the uh unkillable falcon grav tank um but it um yeah just sort of tweaked more tweaks more enhancements uh refined the game a bit more um and it was a very fun edition and i think a lot of people have fond memories of fifth edition um i think it is definitely one of the more popular editions of the game and around this time um we're into the game in big in a big way um no longer have i just got a necron army but i've built up a Black Legion army, um, my Nid force is growing, and with the release of fifth edition came the Black Reach set, um, and what a fantastic start set this was. Came with um, a huge amount of orcs, the Death Copters, um, and the sort of snap fit models that were really cool, um, and I've still got a lot of them in my orc army to this day. Um, that was a great start set and uh, a good set of rules. Um, then later on, we get into sort of uh, the 6th edition and 7th edition. Um, but around this time, things in life, um, real life gets in the way sometimes of the hobby. Wasn't a good time for me. Um, a lot of upheaval in life. Uh, the Part, partner I was with at the time we ended up breaking up and ended up you know having to move out and things changed and you know circumstances changed and um, also just for not so depressing reasons you know I was into sort of uh, Xbox quite a bit I used to play a lot online um, and got into that and the, the hobby was always sort of there in the background but uh, just slowly sort of phased out of it um, money became tight um, I ended up selling off a lot of my stuff. Um, one of the last things I was to sell off was my Necron army, um, which broke my heart, actually. Um, it was 3,000 points, everything fully painted, based. Um, it was the only army I had completed. You know, I was working on the other three armies, starting to get paint on them and things. But this army was, you know, this was, was my army. Um, and... Uh, loved it but uh yeah ended up selling it on ebay sold it sold it i remember now even um sold it a dutch guy won the bid and um got it for much much cheaper than it was worth 
in my opinion. Um, and then uh, then had then had the nerve to quibble about the uh, postage cost. Um, but yeah, sold it off, and then once I'd done that, I kind of thought, well, I'm not playing it anymore, and uh, so I might as well sell off everything and just because I need the money. Sold off the whole lot, everything, literally everything. I kept sort of two or three models that I was particularly proud of, um, just as display pieces, just to keep. Um, but yeah, sold it all off. And then, so 6th and 7th edition largely went by um, without me really playing and experiencing the hobby much and just sort of... Uh, closed off from it i always um read the books though black library novels um watched youtube videos played like games workshop computer games and things so i was always aware of the hobby and i always uh, was reading about it and i'd still occasionally pick up a copy of white dwarf and read about it and stuff and if i was in a store anywhere and i'd see the stuff i'd always pop in and have a look um because it was always a bit of a regret of mine it was always something i, I missed but uh yeah it was uh yeah sad times but then um a little later on um coming more close to present day now I'm more settled and uh in my life and uh I start reading and seeing um the rumors and things about 8th edition on the way and uh seeing what um games workshop are doing because over and start getting quite excited because over the um sort of previous years i see uh how the game had sort of gone downhill the club i used to go to um basically people lost interest people weren't enjoying seventh edition and they were just leaving and the hobby um for other games and things and eventually the club got such low numbers that it had to just close down and close its doors which was a real shame um but uh, then I started reading about 8th edition and seeing uh, the sort of rumours and uh, the sneak peeks and the stuff that was being put on Warhammer community and uh, got me very interested because I really started to like what I was seeing and it was a real big push towards a new, better edition of the game. Um, and I was missing the hobby and now that my life was a bit more stable again, um, I was more settled and I had a little bit of disposable income. Not much, but a little bit. I thought it was uh, the perfect time to get back in the hobby. But, uh, so I called a friend of mine, Reroll Joe, is what I like to call him, um, who I used to play with back in the 5th edition days, and asked him if he still had his stuff, and uh, if he still played. And he texts, you know, he, he asked me, but he said, you know, he doesn't, he didn't play anymore because there was no one to play against, uh, but he still had all the stuff. He hadn't sold anything from back in the day. He still had it all, um, and he would definitely be up for playing again if I was. So that was it then. Um, so I decided to get myself back into the hobby. So I picked up the uh, Orc Codex and started buying up Orcs and uh, got a small force together. And then we met up for a game, and I was amazed to see when we met up for the game, he still had, uh, he still has some of the old scenery pieces that I had built at the time, and completely forgotten that I'd given them to him when I sort of phased out of the hobby. Um, so that was a real, that was a real. Uh, I was pleased to see him. Basically, it was a nice little bit of nostalgia, and it was one little small part from that time of fond memories that I thought I would never see again. Um, but to see some of the scenery pieces and stuff that I'd made back then um, was quite cool. Um, and we still use them to this day on our, in our games. Um, but yeah, we started playing again and then uh, 8th edition launched um, and that's it. Um, that's just, 8th edition has been amazing um, and really drawn me back into the hobby. Um, Cause just getting back into it, we were, we were playing 7th edition and uh, Although we were having fun, we were enjoying the game like we always did. Um, it was, oh, it was, it was very complicated. Um, didn't like the whole sort of uh, formations thing. Um, the game seemed very unbalanced. The rules were so weighted down with uh, 
complications and different rules that conflicted with each other and it just was um games took a long time um we were constantly flipping back through the rule book to try and find specific rules and how things worked um but then 8th edition came out very soon after and uh yeah just haven't looked back since in my opinion it, it is the best edition of the game we've ever had um of all the editions i've played it's definitely the one i'm enjoying the most um it's just fantastic and uh some of the models and the ranges that are out now are great um and i've just picked up uh forge bane actually and uh got the uh necron force out of that which i'm really pleased with because uh that was an army for years i just regretted selling so much now listen if 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 you have painted models you paint an army you've got an army that you love and you play with a lot and it's your passion but if for whatever reason you stop playing the game for whatever reason say money's tight times are hard you need to make money somehow or you just get bored of the game do not do what i did do not sell it do not give it away um because you never know when things will change in the future and you'll want to get back into the hobby um and when you do get back into the hobby your army's still sitting there for you but like my mate joe um he's just got back into hobby at the same time as me but it, all his stuff's still there um he just had to dust it off and take it out again and get playing again um and for me, um, I had to start from scratch, basically. Um, so I'm currently playing... Uh, I've built my Orc army up to about 3,000 points now. It's a big army, um, a lot of models. Um, I've only just started painting it and getting together um, on my channel. If you haven't already, you can see some of my conversions and things that I've done. Um, so that's um, getting there anyway. But it's going to be a long, long, slow process painting that up. Um and that's why it's sort of so gutting, really, because I knew I had army fully painted, and uh, to sort of start from scratch again it is hard, uh, and it's expensive starting from scratch. Once you're into the hobby, once you've got your paint sets, you've got your army, and that you're not usually, anyway, spending huge amounts of money in one hit. You're just adding a unit to your army, a character here, a vehicle there. Um, <coughs> As you're painting, you might need a few more paints, different colours. So you buy one or two paints and, you know, you're just spending small amounts of money each time. But when you start from scratch, you, you've you got to get the rule book, you've got to get your dice, you've got to get the models, you've got to get the paints. Um, it's, a, it's a massive <clears throat> initial outlay to, to get into it. So it's been a slow process. But it is building up nicely now. And uh, and now I've just started the Necrons again. Oh, that's it. Um, um, oh, that's just going to be incredible. And uh, Forge Bane was just irresistible. I couldn't resist that. And uh, I've not played Necrons since the original Codex. Uh, the last two Codexes that came out, I never played. Um, I was going right back to that original one. Back when uh, the Catan were actually Catan, not Shards. Um now, I know the army is very different now, but I'm looking forward to getting back into it and learning how it's changed and playing with them again. And uh, I'm sort of doing them for the same reasons as I did before, um, because they're going to be quite easy and quick to paint. Um, I'm probably going to sort of focus on getting them painted um, so I can use them for battle reports and things on the channel. Um, and then in, meanwhile, in the background, I can just... Uh, takes the pressure off with getting my orc army ready um that will still be my sort of primary army i think but uh i will just sort of paint that up in the background and slowly get that up um because orcs are great for um customization and uh i love the orcs always have done um but necrons have always been my um they were my sort of first love really my original army um after a few false starts they were the army that i really sort of uh properly got into the game properly learnt the rules um properly built my painting skills on um and uh yeah had good success with them so i'm really really fucking chuffed to have necrons again because they're just the coolest um and yeah that's where i'm now in the game um 
another thing I was sort of uh, wanted to do was, uh, which I am doing now, is do my own YouTube channel. Um, so <laughs> you're watching this video now, so you know I've done it. Um, it's been going sort of about a month and a half now, maybe. Um, not too long, still very new. Um, and yeah, I've been loving doing it. Um, it's been great. Um, it was uh, something I always fancied doing. Didn't know whether I would be capable of doing it or whether I'd do a very good good job of it. Um, I think it's going okay. I still I work um, and I've got a family, so time is limited. I would love to really sort of put more time into the hobby and more time into the channel, um, but other things in life you know come first real life comes first children work bills all that's you know your partner all all that stuff comes first before the hobby but um i would like to have uh more time to put into the channel um but at the moment that's just not possible um, i've seen a lot of advice from fellow youtubers and things that say you know launch your videos the same time every week you know have a regular thing keep producing content and stuff um which yeah is all good advice but i just simply can't do that really i can't sort of um restrict myself to doing a regular slot um and also then i think i would end up making videos for the sake of making videos just because oh it's you know friday night seven o'clock i've got to have a video up you know um i don't want to just release i don't want to release shit just for the sake of it I want to make a video if I've got something to say or I think it might be a good video or it's going to be of interest to someone. Um, so they're just going to sort of... Videos are going to happen when they happen, really. But uh, I'm, my plan is to try and release sort of one to two videos a week. Um, but sometimes a bit of time might pass between where I don't do videos because, again, real life, work, overtime, family, it all does come first. Um, but uh, this hobby's great. Um, because real life does get hard at times. Um, the stresses of life, especially when you've got a family, um, you've got to earn money, bills never stop. Um, <laughs> work, you know, you've got to work if you want to live um, and have any sort of quality of life. Um, I do suffer as well. Um, over the years, I've suffered with things like uh, depression, um, anxiety attacks and stuff. Um, and uh, God, this video is getting personal, isn't it? But sod it. Um, yeah, things uh, things get on top of you sometimes, and you know, this hobby has always been there. Um, it's always been an escape. Um, it's nice. It's a. It's nice to switch your brain off from real life sometimes. And head off into the forty-first millennium, or into a you know a fantasy realm, um, and you're not going out to work nine till five. You're not paying your council tax and your bills and trying to put food on the table. Um, you're not dealing with the, all these pressures and stress. You're rampaging through the stars, causing war. <laughs> you're creating stuff. You're letting your imagination run riot. Um, you're letting your inner child out, let's be honest. I mean, most of us watch um, playing this hobby, doing these videos and stuff, we're grown men. Um, we're just guys that haven't grown up, <laughs> if we're honest. Um, let's face it, we're sitting there playing with little toy soldiers. Um, but, uh, hell, it's fun, so fuck it. Um, I think, <laughs> but that's quite common, I think, in in us guys um in the old days it used to be old men in their um shed or in their loft playing with train sets and whatnot um i think that sort of thing's always been there but it's nice it's nice to have an escape from real life um and focus on something and i think uh it's it's better than things like computer games and stuff and uh you know other kind of uh escapist hobbies and things because you've got something to show for it at the end of it you know, you're creating stuff. Um, you've got something to be proud of once you've built and painted a model or an army. And uh, that's great. And uh, it's, 
there's, there's 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 so many different things. It's a hobby that you can't really get bored of because um, there's so many different aspects to it. You know, if you get a bit tired out or a bit burnt out from painting, um, you can concentrate on building some stuff, converting some things. If you get burnt out from that, you can just focus on playing the games and having fun. You know, for competitively. Um, if you get bored of that, you can just read up on the law, um, read the books, and uh, you know, just sort of lose yourself in the um, the history of it all and. It's just got so many different avenues and stuff to the hobby that um, keeps you interested and keeps you coming back for more. And uh, the 40k universe is just is just awesome. Um, it's amazing. And uh, making these videos has been fun and been good. Um, the channel is sort of steadily climbing. I think I'm currently on sort of nearing 60 subscribers. Um, I know. Woohoo, eh? Um, but you know, start small. Um, I've only been going about a month and a bit now. I'm hoping to carry on growing. Hope to make stuff that you guys like. Um, very shortly after launching the video and making my first couple of um, uh, launching the channel, I mean, and making my first couple of videos, um, contacted uh, Idik Beer, who um, very nicely gave me a little promotion um, on the uh, his Facebook page which I've joined the uh, Wargamers Unification Group, um, which has been incredible. Um, it's a cool page um, full of other YouTubers, other gamers um, that they're there to support each other, give advice. Um, and, uh, yeah, that's been great. And that's really been a cause for giving me my channel a bit of a kickstart and a boost and getting me some, subscri some subscribers and getting people to watch. And, uh, yeah, is because... Uh, I'm not making these videos to sort of, uh, I don't know, make money or anything. It's it's just for the fun of doing them. Um, but And so it's subscribers and views and stuff shouldn't really matter too much. But uh, let's face it, if no one was watching them, you wouldn't make them because you'd just be talking to yourself and uh, you know, what would be the point. Um, so it's and it's great to see people uh, leaving sort of positive comments and feedback and stuff and liking what they see enough that they want to subscribe and watch more videos and that's really good and it's things like that give you give me the boost to keep going with it um, and hopefully the channel continues to grow and grow and uh, see more success and I get better at doing what I'm doing and get a bit more natural at talking um, <laughs> I think. Uh, for me anyway when I'm making these videos it's very easy to fall into the trap of putting on almost like your phone voice you know um, where this one I've, I've really tried to uh, just be natural and be myself and I think uh, as I keep making more videos that's gonna become easier and easier just to sort of relax and chill out a bit and just uh, just just be myself um, I think the videos will be better that way and I think they'll be uh, more natural and um, just go from there. The downside of that means is I'll do what I'm doing right now and ramble and waffle on a bit and uh, looking at the timer on this video so far, geez this really has been my longest video. We are heading up for almost an hour so I think uh, I'm going to bring that to a close. Um, anyway, that was my personal history through Games Workshop and Warhammer 40k. Um, if you want to share your history or your thoughts or where you first started the hobby or any comments, anything like that, please share it in the comments below. Or maybe you fellow YouTubers out there, I'd probably be, well, would be, I'd be interested to hear your stories, you know, where you came into the hobby um, and your history with it. Um, so uh, if you wanted to make a video responses to this I'd be well up for seeing that um, but anyway guys thank you so much for watching and listening to me waffle on um, and literally give my life story um, if you're new to this channel um, please like and subscribe it does mean the world to me anyway guys I'm going to get off and see you on the next one 6 plus Steve-O signing out